Greetings, adventurers, and well met. Welcome to the Master of Dungeons Twitch channel. I'm Master of Dungeons here at twitch.tv slash the Master of Dungeons. It is Tuesday, which means that it's time for our Dungeons and Deliberations, uh, where people come in, ask me questions if they want, but uh, in the meantime, we're going to be talking about different Dungeons and Dragons topics, and today we're going to kind of uh, go back to the beginning a little bit uh, for some of the uh, viewers that might be new. Dungeons and Dragons, uh, and uh, talk about character creation, basically the basics of how to create a character for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Um, we're going to work on creating a character, then I'm actually, after I created the character, I'm going to level the character up, kind of doing the different decision making to show you how to, when, it, when your adventure, uh, when your dungeon master says, okay, everyone's gained enough XP to level up, how you can level up your character and such as well. Uh, and as I'm doing it, I had one of our viewers, Nova, ask about uh, creating a fighter that is a strong protector, that does everything they can to protect uh, their uh, party members. So what we're going to work on is we're going to first create a basic character uh, of a fighter, and then we're going to go through and uh, level that fighter up through, uh, eventually becoming a cavalier and choosing the different, uh, different abilities and such that they get, uh, get as they level. So the first thing we're going to do is create a character sheet. Um, name the character Sir Ivan. We don't need to put uh, our name in here. I'm just using Roll20 as an example. It's mostly because a Roll20 character sheet is uh, pretty much the same as a standard Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition sheet. Uh, you can plug this in, uh, this information into uh, D&D Beyond. Uh, you can uh, edit the sheet directly, of course, if you're in Rule 20. Uh, obviously, writing it down on a regular pen and paper sheet or pencil and paper sheet. Uh, but for this, we're going to use the Character Mancer, uh, which is a uh, utility here in Rule 20, uh, which is the virtual tabletop that I use. Um, and the Character Mancer has got a lot of uh, really great features in there. Uh, if you don't have the books in Rule 20 or you're free, uh, to use member or, or plus member, uh, you might not have, you will probably have to enter in a lot of uh, uh, information uh, manually, which is fine because you'd be writing it down on the character sheet anyway. Um, but we're going to use the character mancer. I have all the books for fifth edition, so we're just going to use this to start off. Um, so basically, when you first start to create your character, just have a concept in mind of what you're wanting to play, what type of, uh, do you want to play a caster, do you want to play a, a warrior, do you want to play a roguish type character, do you want to play a support character. Uh, by support characters, of course, uh, if you're new to D&D, uh, I mean something like a healer or something that helps manage the creatures on the battlefield with like different spells that can put some over here to sleep. Uh, hold some in place over here, things like that. Uh, so, but again, as I mentioned, we're going to uh, create a, uh, a, a fighter to start with. Uh, so the first thing, of course, we're going to do is we're going to choose our race. Um, they have a lot of different races. Of course, in uh, the updated books next year, this is going to be called Species. Um, we're going to go ahead and pick a race of uh, creature that... Uh, uh, it's going to get us a little bit of utility, so we're going to create a variant human. Uh, and what a variant human is, is that it's basically, it's, it's variant because it uses, uh, allows you to have feats and such like that, uh, whereas it's going to be obviously a little bit different uh, in uh, one D&D when that comes out next. Um, let's see here, creature type, do we have, can we, do we have a variant human in here for a list? I think we do. V under V? I just can't read. Uh, but we'll go over this human. Uh, we're going to make him lawful. We'll make him neutral good because he's a good guy. Uh, he definitely wants to protect his friends and things of that nature. So first thing you do is, uh, of course, as, as the character mancer is walking you through uh, everything about uh, um, filling in uh, all of your uh, uh, information as you would on a normal character sheet as well. Um, and it just, just plugs everything in there for you. As I mentioned before, I have all the books here so we can pick uh, for the different books uh, for the race that we want to play. We've picked human, um, neutral good. Your creature type, of course, is humanoid. Size is medium. Our speed is 30 feet. That means we can move, if you're using a hex, or, or not hexes, but a grid, uh, most 
the grid is used a five foot square, that means you can move six squares. Uh, and then it picks up the uh, languages you uh, use. As a human, uh, you typically speak common in one other uh, language. Um, since we're going to be a protector, uh, we want to uh, pick something that a lot of creatures might speak. Um, something like Elvish would be a common language, Dwarvish, uh, Celestial. Uh, we're not really going the, the Paladin path, so uh, we can either speak Giant or something like that. Um, let's just go ahead, for the purpose of this, we'll go ahead and pick Draconic. That way we speak Common Draconic. Uh, I think there's where we, oh, there, there's where we picked the Variant, variant Human. Uh, and then we're just going to be a Variant Human, which means that we have different uh, uh, ability score increases. All right here. So we're going to increase their strength, and we're going to increase their constitution, since those are really important for our fighter, because uh, we want to be strong when we're using in melee combat, and our constitution will determine uh, extra hit points and such. And uh, as a human, we also get an extra skill as well as a variant human. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and pick up... And this one could be anything, so let's go ahead and pick up Perception, because we're going to be able to look around and see what's going on in the battlefield. So then next we're going to pick our class. And of course, as we mentioned before, that's just going to be a fighter. Uh, as a fighter, of course, that does give us simple weapons and martial weapons uh, as our weapon proficiencies. That's basically all the weapons in the game. And then armor proficiencies give us light armor, medium armor, heavy armor, and shields, which is basically all of the armors that are in the game. Uh, as a warrior, we also get two uh, proficiencies here, uh, our skill proficiencies. Uh, we're going to be careful. Um, what I generally like to do, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take a break here uh, from the class and go to background, because uh, I generally like to, the character uh, player's handbook has you pick your class and do your abilities and then pick your background and then your equipment and all that such thing. I always encourage players to choose their background first because you get extra skills and such from your and tools perhaps and languages maybe from your background uh, and you don't want to double up on certain skills because they don't uh, give anything extra there. So let's go ahead and before we finish up the uh, fighter, let's go ahead and go to the background first. Um, so we're probably going to go ahead and pick what I was thinking of there's kind of an idea for this character to be a folk hero. Uh, basically what a folk hero is, is that, uh, I should bring it up here, uh, you come from a humble social rank, but you are destined for so much more. Already the people of your home village regard you as their champion. Your destiny calls you to stand against the tyrants and monsters that threaten the common folk everywhere. And then that gives you uh, Animal Handling and Survival as our skills. And then we get a uh, tool proficiency as well as land vehicles, which means we can drive carts, wagons, uh, things of that nature, chariots, uh, etc. And we also get another tool proficiency, and we are going to be a um, cavalier. So we're going to go ahead and pick up metalsmith's tools. Or not metalsmith's tools, there we go, smith's tools. Uh, that way, if we need to, uh, we can always repair our own armor all of that uh, as the fighter as well. Uh, uh, of course, as a folk hero, uh, we do have rustic hospitality. Um, we come from the ranks of the common folk. We fit in amongst them with ease. We can find a place to hide, rest, or recuperate among other commoners, uh, unless we've shown ourselves to be a danger to them. Of course, since we're a cavalier, we're kind of the classic knight, since that's the, the path we're going to eventually take. Or we're the, kind of the classic knight uh, from like a uh, uh, not uh, classic knight from history, but uh, uh, the classic knights from uh, fantasy, where they uh, look to protect everyone. So uh, we'll have this little thing where they'll shield us from uh, different things, uh, someone searching for us, and also give us a place to rest if we need to uh, while we're traveling through. Um, yeah, this is exactly it, Nova. We're walking through teaching people uh, that might be new to D&D how to create a D&D character first, uh, and then we're going to go through and show them how to level the uh, character up and what proficiencies to take and uh, such like that, what feats to take, uh, etc. Uh, so, so far we've um, started with the hu variant human and we're going to the background, then going back to the uh, fighter since we we'll already have some uh, proficiencies there. 
Uh, so it'll give us a few different things to choose from. So our defining event. Um, this, of course, is, helps you with your character backstory. Uh, hence the reason why it's a background. Uh, you can come up with like a couple of paragraphs uh, for what led to you becoming like a folk hero. And uh, we'll say that we saved people during a natural disaster. We can Maybe it was a volcano eruption or an earthquake or perhaps a hurricane or a tornado or something like that came through the village. And the character, this character, uh, went through and saved them all, uh, as you know heroes do, and that's one of the reasons why they're a, uh, a folk hero. Uh, we're going to find the personality traits. Uh, what your personality traits are when you're creating a character uh, is not exactly what your how your character acts all the time. Uh, however, they are great to use as uh, prompts for your role playing. So when you role play your character, when you first begin role playing your character, it gives you some different ideas of what you can use uh, to, you know, some different uh, personality traits, and an ideal, a bond, and a flaw that uh, all part of your character's character, as it were, uh, and they can help you uh, to role play your character. Now, what I always um, the advice I always give uh, players and uh, new players and even experienced players is, is that your character is not necessarily bound by that. If you take these personality traits and you go from playing your character at level 1 all the way up to level 20, if you don't stray away from these personality traits, uh, then, in my opinion at least, you're, you're missing out a little bit on the game uh, of what's called character development. As your character grows, uh, as they go through the adventures, as they meet other NPCs, as they meet other PCs and other characters, uh, that they can uh, change their outlooks and such like that. So your starting personality traits are just something to give you an idea of how the character is when they first start off. And of course you could always change these. Again, these aren't something that are really tied to your statistics or anything like that. They're just basically flavor for your character. Uh, and you can, like if you find the different personality traits that your character might grow and change uh, from, uh, as you're playing the character. That's what the uh, personality traits, the ideals, and the bonds, and the flaws are. So starting off, we're going to go ahead and pick um, some personality traits. Um, let's see here. We'll get two of these. Uh, first of all, let's go ahead and select, again, he's a... He's a a hero. He is a cavalier. Eventually, is what he's going to become. He's a folk hero. So, if someone's in trouble. He's always ready to lend a hand, uh, lend help. Uh, and then, um, let's see. For our second one, let's say that uh, they have a strong sense of fair play and always try to find the most equitable solution to arguments. That's good. Uh, ideal. Uh, let's just. Go ahead and look for, uh, well, we got half fairness and strong sense of fair play. Uh, but we are playing a neutral character. Uh, so let's go ahead and go with respect. People deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Uh, and then the bond we'll have as a uh, folk hero. Uh, there we go. I protect those who cannot protect themselves. That's the whole point of playing a cavalier and a protective style of fighter uh, is the protection. And that's the whole thing. The reason why the character does all that is because they have a bond to. Now we get to pick a flaw for them. Uh, obviously, when you're creating your characters, uh, if you're creating for, for uh, your organized play for AL, uh, some of these things won't necessarily transfer over to uh, Adventures League Play since it's a portable system uh, and organized play system. Uh, so like you might have a tyrant who rules the land and stop at nothing to see you killed, but at the same time that might probably won't ever come into play in Adventures League. Um, but it does come into play with your backstory. So when you create your backstory you could you know put something in from uh, one of the areas around uh, or perhaps maybe tie it into uh, the campaign that you're playing. Uh, obviously, with these, when you're playing a homebrew system, a homebrew game, you want to talk with your dungeon master about uh, your different flaws and such. That way, they have an idea of, especially if you're playing homebrew, as I mentioned, they're creating the adventures or they're uh, running 
you know, adventures from different sources uh, to, to create their own story. Uh, that way they can weave those in uh, and uh, put those in for your character uh, to, to experience uh, as the party progresses through their adventures. Uh, so we're going to pick for this one, since we're keeping it kind of generic, oh, we don't want to have a, a, a weakness for that. Um, let's say... Let's go ahead and say he, he's not like cocky or anything like that, but he is convinced that eventually he will become a fine uh, knight and cavalier. Uh, and uh, he might have a few shortcomings here and there, but that's something where the character can learn and grow from uh, as, as it progresses. So we're gonna go ahead and take the uh, convinced of my destiny and blind to my shortcomings and the risk of failure. Uh, so he's not really necessarily wanting to jump into action, but he is a bit foolhardy once he does. You know, maybe maybe that's the way the character uh, can be played. Uh, we also start off with a shovel and iron pot, some common clothes, and a belt pouch, and a set of art, artisan tools. Uh, so we've got the background down, so let's go back to the class now. And we went with fighter. And now that we've picked our background, now we can go through and we can pick some new skills. Uh, and we'll show you all the skills that we already have from our background, which is great. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and go with athletics because he is a strength-based character. Um, and cavaliers aren't required in, in fifth edition, I should say. In, in older editions, cavaliers were uh, required to have charisma because it was more obviously a, a different time. Uh, they're more of a chivalry, chivalry type of thing, you know, save the fair maiden. But obviously, uh, Dungeons and Dragons has gotten a lot better and more progressive in that regard. Uh, so we're not really going to necessarily go with uh, intimidation because that's a uh, uh, charisma-based thing. We're going to let the more charismatic, you know, uh, char other characters play the face kind of, and just kind of be like the silent protector uh, kind of in the background. Um, so we're not really going to go with intimidation. Uh, history not necessarily maybe a knowledgeable or intelligent character maybe they didn't have being a folk hero they may not have uh, gotten uh, a whole lot of, uh, of schooling other than you know like some uh, education from around their village uh, so no formal education necessarily so let's go ahead and pick insight as uh, they've got a keen insight into you know kind of reading people uh, especially as a protector they're always going to be with our having perception as well we're going to give them insight so that way they can, you know, oh, they're always looking for situations where they might come up uh, to uh, uh, have to defend their, their uh, companions and such like that. <laughs> um, not necessarily caveman. I mean, they're, they're just from a small village, but uh, definitely, definitely not a scholar, that's for sure. Um, and obviously, that's, this is just this particular character as well. Uh, and then also as a fighter, we get to choose a fighting style. D adopt a particular style of fighting as our specialty. We choose one of the following options. We can't take a fighting style more than once. Uh, even if we get it uh, later, get to choose again another fighting style. We still ha we can't choose the same si fighting style twice. Uh, there's a bunch of different fighting styles here. There's some from that we have from Tasha's as well. Um, but what we're going to do is we are playing a protection type of character. So we're going to go ahead and select the uh, protection fighting style. Uh, basically, when a creature we see attacks a target other than us, within five feet of us, we can use our reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll. Of course, we must be wielding a shield. So that's one of the first things we're going to do as a protection style uh, uh, tank, as it were, uh, fighter, uh, is go ahead and select our fighting style of protection. Um, we have our second wind, which means on our turn as a fighter, we can take a bonus action to heal ourselves uh, a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, it does start off with our uh, equipment here. Uh, it's just letting us know what we can pick from. Uh, here in a moment, we're going to be able to choose uh, that equipment uh, as well. Next. Next, we have our ability score method. Uh, when you're creating a character, uh, obviously you want to talk with your dungeon master about how they want you to generate your ability scores. Your ability scores are your uh, basic uh, six ability scores. Uh, your strength, your dexterity, your constitution, your intelligence, your wisdom, and your charisma. Uh, obviously, strength and constitution are, are really important for warriors. Uh, dexterity is very important for like your rogues and your rangers and such like that. Uh, your monks as well. Uh, your intelligence is really important for your wizards. Uh, and even rogues' uh, intelligence is really good as well. 
uh, wisdoms for like your druids and your your uh, clerics uh, and such like that. And then charisma is good for uh, like your paladins, warlocks, and uh, sorcerers and uh, bards as well. Uh, so since we're playing a fighter, uh, obviously strength and constitution is what we put our bonuses in as a variant human. Uh, so then we would go to generate our ability scores. Now, every DM usually has their own basic, uh, their own house rules, uh, as it were, uh, for rolling your, determining your uh, ability score method. Uh, for example, I run a lot of Adventurers League, and the Adventurers League uses the point by method. But the point by, we're not going to use the point by method for this, but what the point by method is, is that you have 27 points available, and each one of these, uh, you, you actually pick the stat. They can go, they can start uh, from uh, as low as an 8 all the way up to a 15. Obviously, those are adjusted uh, with your racial adjustments uh, as well on top of that. So you would, you'd go through and you'd pick 27 points worth of uh, different stats. So, like, for example, if we wanted the strength of 15, uh, that is a full nine points. So a 15 costs nine points. So that only leave, would leave us with 18 points remaining. So if we wanted to, you could start off with, you know, a 15 con, a 15 uh, intelligence, and then we could start off with an eight dexterity, an eight wisdom, and an eight charisma. That's interesting. It's got some bonuses uh, over here. It's got some negatives over there. Uh, you could mix them up in between uh, all of that. Um, I think the standard is a 15, uh, 14, 13, 12, 10, 8, I believe. Yeah, I think uh, 14, 13, yeah, 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 8 that are the... Uh, uh, standards there, so we can drop that down to a 10, drop that up to a 13, uh, drop the charisma up to uh, 10, something like that, if we were, you know, point buying. Uh, but what I'm going to do today is kind of show you how to roll uh, your your uh, stats as well. Now, if we roll for your stats, there's uh, different ways uh, to uh, roll your stats. The standard way that in Dungeons and Dragons uh, used to be you would roll, yes, my, my familiar is uh, crying out, she did wake up. Uh, but the standard of way of rolling your ability scores in the past was you would roll 3d6 and you would add them up and that's what you would use for your stats. So you would roll 3d6 for your strength, put that in there, 3d6 for your dex, put that in there, 3d6 for your con, all the way down like that. And then you would look at your stats and say, okay, this, for my stats, what do I want to play? Well, obviously, different... DMs have different house rules, and some of the rules have changed over the uh, years, obviously, and the people have adapted different methods of rolling them. Uh, currently, it's roll four dice six, and you drop the lowest uh, of the uh, four dice six, and then you add the three uh, the highest three dice six uh, uh, rolls, add those together for your stats, and then you get to place them where you want to place them. Uh, and then uh, what I do for my campaigns is I allow the characters, and of course I allow the characters to place their stats as well, uh, and I have a little macro down here, but I allow them to do the 4 dice 6 method, and what they get to do is they get to roll three sets of stats, and then they pick which set of those that they want for their character. So basically, like for example, uh, I do have a macro already set up, we'll do this, we'll roll three different sets of stats. Alright, so we've got a uh, set here, which is not bad. We have a set here, which is not bad, and we have a so, which is okay. It's got some high stuff, but it's got something really, really low. Uh, so if we wanted to put like a five in his charisma or something of that nature, it could be like when he, when he saved them from that, when he saved the villagers and such from the uh, natural disaster, that it become became horribly scarred, uh, or perhaps uh, it uh, something happened to him where uh, it. Uh, uh, impedes the way that he speaks or something of that nature um, to, you know, help add flavor and diversity to, to the character and uh, the character that we're playing. Um, and then, of course, we have something down here that's not too bad. It's got a couple of, of uh, lower uh, um, stats, um, but it's got some good average and, you know, not, uh, not too bad on the high end there. Uh, but I do like the idea of keeping the middle 
uh, set uh, for the character. Uh, we don't even have to put the uh, five in there. Uh... We don't even have to put the five in their charisma. We can always put the five like in their dexterity. They're really great, but they're just clumsy. <laughs> um, but I like the idea, especially from a character growth uh, standpoint, for the characters that actually have a five charisma. And we could, of course, determine why they have that low of a charisma uh, later on. Uh, as you know, at, when you're playing your character, work with your dungeon master to come up with a reason why they would have such a low uh, charisma. Uh, so let's put the five there. In the charisma, let's put. We want to put the fifteen in the uh, strength, because that's going to get a bonus up to a sixteen. Uh, we want to put the other fifteen in the constitution, which will be boosted up to a sixteen because of our, our bonuses there. Uh, we also have a uh, another uh, sixteen uh, that I think what we should do is put that into our because we're going to be wearing. Uh, eventually wearing heavy armor, medium or heavy armor, and we don't really get a bonus to our dexterity uh, from the armor. You do, if you have a negative to your dexterity, you do uh, apply that penalty to your uh, armor class. Uh, but uh, not with, with a heavy armor, you do not apply any dexterity bonuses there. So let's go ahead and um, we did pick uh, insight and perception as a couple of their skills and wisdom uh, is really uh, important for that as well. So let's put a our actual 16 in their wisdom score and then we have still a 12 and a 13 we're gonna put a 13 in the intelligence and we'll put the 12 in the dexterity so they're okay dexterous wise they're fairly healthy uh, they're fairly wise and then of course their charisma will come up with you know the character or whoever plays the character can come up with the uh, reason with their dungeon master about why uh, their charisma would be so low all right, so we've got our ability scores. Go next, we would create a background if you're following the standard character uh, player handbook method of uh, creating uh, your characters. Uh, as I mentioned, I like to have the players, as, when I'm creating a character, select the background before I actually select the class or start working on the class. That way I have an idea of uh, what extra skills I already have. All right, so we'll go to next. Uh, normally, when you choose your equipment, Ask your DM in Adventurers League. The Adventurers League automatically uses class equipment, uh, which uh, is fairly quick and easy. Uh, there's also the starting wealth. Some Dungeon Masters will have you roll up your gold, and then when you roll up your gold, you have that amount of gold to purchase things from the player's hand, purchase your items from the player's handbook. Uh, I always like to go with the class equipment in my campaigns just because it makes it easier for the characters to not necessarily forget to purchase something and then not have the funds to do so. Uh, so we'll just go class equipment. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and pick chain mail because we again want them to be a tank. We want them to have a higher armor class. Uh, need to shield or martial weapon. We're gonna go ahead and pick a shield for them. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and go with the classic long sword as their martial weapon. And then they get a light crossbow and a crossbow bolts or two hand axes. Uh, this is a preference of the player. Um, like crossbows and crossbow bolts, use your dexterity for attacking. Our, our dex isn't too bad, uh, but the hand axe, uh, we, since it's a thrown weapon, we can use our strength. Uh, we don't have as much range on the hand axe, but uh, the whole concept of the character is to kind of move forward to protect everyone behind them so they can move forward a little bit and then throw a hand axe obviously retrieving it afterwards instead of standing back and fighting uh, with or firing with a light crossbow. So let's go ahead and pick two hand axes there. Uh, the Dungeoneer's Pack and the Explorer's Pack, uh, they, uh, those are listed in the player's handbook, so we can go ahead and uh, look those up. So you have a Dungeoneer's Pack here, and then we have the Explorer's Pack. pack there. So now we can compare the two. Uh, Dungeoneer's pack contains a backpack, a crowbar, a hammer, tin uh, pythons, tin torches, tinderbox rations, water skin, and hempen rope. 
Uh, this one over here, the Explorer's Pack, contains backpack, bedroll, mess kit, tinderbox, torch, rations, water skin, and hemp and rope. Uh, so the difference here is that we don't get a mess kit over here, but we do get one here. And we get a bedroll here, not over here, but we don't get the um, pitons, pitons, however you'd like to pronounce them. I usually pronounce them pitons, pitons, however you want to say it. Uh, and the hammer and the crowbar. Um, so let's just go ahead and go with the Dungeoneers pack for now. You can always pick up, if we have extra a coin, a bedroll or a mess kit uh, as well. There's usually a little bit of that uh, left over. Let's go ahead and pick a Dungeoneers pack. Not equipment, uh, you can list, uh, obviously on your character sheet, list all of the equipment uh, as uh, you, when you pick up your uh, Dungeoneers pack, list all the equipment in your uh, inventory as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, we get our equipment from our background. We get a uh, shovel, iron pot, common clothes, belt pouch, and we get a set of artisan's tools. And we did pick the smith's tools, so let's go ahead and grab ourselves some smith's tools. That way we'll have them uh, starting off. So that's all the equipment. Of course, this section is spells. We're a fighter. We don't have any uh, spells, obviously. Uh, now we should get a feat because we are playing a variant human uh, at first level. Uh, so there's a lot of great ones to pick up. We can pick up alert, which would increase our initiative, which would allow us to go first, uh, go, give us a chance, to, a higher chance to go first into combats. Uh, there's also the athlete feat. Um, there's crusher if we were using uh, crushing weapons. There's slasher. Uh, things like that, um, fighting initiate, great weapon master, uh, we're not really using that, we do heavy armor master, that would actually reduce damage uh, that we take if we're wearing heavy armor, every hit would take away three, we take three points away from every hit, as long as it's not a magical hit. Um, inspiring leader uh, is really cool because that would give your all of your companions uh, with a 10 minute pep talk basically uh, extra uh, temporary hit points uh, that last until they either are, are taken away from uh, uh, during like combat or uh, the characters finish a short re or a long rest I should say uh, they could have temporary extra hit points um, but as a someone that protects uh, our companions. Not only do we have protection, uh, but we're going to go ahead and start with Sentinel. Uh, what Sentinel does is pop up here. Uh, we have master techniques to take advantage of every drop of an enemy's guard, gaining the following benefits. We hit a creature with an opportunity attack. That creature's speed becomes zero. That means if something tries to leave us to go after, like say we have our caster or like our wizard or our clerics over there healing someone and the monster wants to leave us to go stop them from doing that, we have a chance to hit them. If we hit them, they can't move. So they can't go over there to go after uh, that other person. Um, if they take the action to disengage, which normally when you take an action to disengage, you disengage from the combat and you can move away and you do not provoke opportunity attacks. However, if you have Sentinel and a creature decides to disengage, you still get your opportunity attacks uh, against them uh, because you are a Sentinel. And of course, the cool feature is when a creature within five feet of you makes an attack against a target other than you, and that doesn't have this feat, you can cause your reaction to make a use your reaction to make a melee weapon attack against the attacking creature. So that basically gives us a couple of different things that we can use uh, to help protect our companions. We can use our protection uh, fighting style, so we can use our reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll. Uh, or, for example, if the creature that's, a, that's attacking our companion doesn't necessarily, they look bloody, they look almost ready to be out of the combat or whatever, almost ready to be taken out, instead of using our reaction that way, we can use our reaction to attack that creature instead, possibly uh, taking them out uh, of the combat. Uh, so we did made his name Sir Ivan. We're going to make him fairly young. We'll just level, uh, raise him up uh, a year for every level that we go. Uh, we'll make them just a, a, even six foot. Uh, he's fairly strong, uh, fairly fit. Let's give him 175 pounds outside of all of his equipment and everything of that nature as well. 
Uh, of course, eyes, hair color, uh, all of that is always personal preference. Um, I myself tend to, to, to go with uh, natural uh, colors, uh, except for the hair. Sometimes the character might might have blue hair, dyed hair blue, you know, pink, whatever. Uh, but for this, let's go ahead. And he's just like the old. Um, let's just go with the classic <laughs> blue eyes and blonde hair for him. Um, we'll put weathered skin because he does, you know, have a tendency to work out, uh, work outdoors a lot uh, in the uh, uh, community. Uh, so we have uh, the end of the character creation. That's pretty much the end of creating a first level character. Um, obviously, all of this is subject to whatever you want it to be for uh, all of your character's appearance. Uh, all of that um, might even talk with your dungeon master about what types of things are common in their campaign world. They might have like a race of elves uh, who that their hair like or, or perhaps maybe gold or metallic colored or something like that. Um, you might have uh, different, you know, uh, groups of gnomes that have different types of skin colors and things like that. They might be, you know, green or a shade, you know, a shade of bluish green or something like that. So always check into those uh, types of things when you're making your character with your dungeon master because there are really some really cool, uh, diverse ways you can uh, flavor your character in that manner. So we'll hit apply changes here. And for the character master, of course, it's just building the character sheet. Uh, the character's all done, everything's all filled out for us, uh, ready to go. Uh, obviously, of course, you have your character sheet, uh, your pen and paper, or pencil and paper sheet uh, looks fairly similar to this uh, as well. And uh, of course, if you're using D&D Beyond, plugging it to your D&D Beyond, uh, and uh, I myself never made a character on D&D &D Beyond, so I'm not sure uh, how the character creation process works there. Uh, and of course, different VTTs, um, if you're familiar with those, or your Dungeon Master's familiar with those, they can aid you in creating uh, your character there. Uh, we have a little bit of time left over, so what we're going to do is go ahead, we don't have to make a whole bunch of decisions when we level them up, but we'll go ahead and level them up uh, a little bit. We've got about um, 17 minutes or so left uh, for the stream. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll come back up here to the character master. Once your character uh, gets 300 experience points, that gets them to second level. Uh, if your dungeon master doesn't use experience points, they just use milestones, uh, the dungeon master will let you know during the story when your character would level up. So once your character levels up, you advance your character to second level. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead, to, like I said, use the character master here. Uh, the steps are pretty much the same thing. If you're using the pencil and paper or D&D Beyond, uh, they'll help you with the selecting of uh, the, the choices that you get. But obviously, of course, your dungeon master should be completely willing uh, to help you level up your character. So what we're going to do, we have a first level folk hero uh, fighter. Um, we're going to go ahead and just go ahead and continue with fighter. So we're going to take him to uh, level two. Uh, generally, when a character levels up, uh, of course, it is also um, take care. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, but uh, always talk with your DM about how they do hit points. Um, generally, the book itself you, you have an average. So, for example, it's a uh, your average uh, for for the uh, your hit points is whatever your hit dice is, which in this case is a uh, D10, is is you generally half plus point five which rounds up to a uh, half plus one, basically. So if your hit dice is a D6 and you're taking the average hit points, you get four hit points. If your hit dice is a D12, you're taking the average, which would be seven. Uh, what I tend to do with, with uh, my homebrew games is I allow the characters to roll the dice, and if the dice is less than the average, I'll let them take the average. Um, it's interesting. Some DMs might want to play, you know, just roll the dice and let the dice fall where they may. I've played that way before. It's a lot of fun to do it that way. You can switch them up even as a DM if you want. It's completely uh, your and yours and your dungeon master's preference. Uh, my myself, after a while, those types of things, you know, they just get, they're not as, um, the novelty, I guess, is the, the way I look at it wears off, uh, for, for me at least. 
So we're going to go ahead and use my system, which is use the average for six or roll. So we're going to roll to see if we get better. And we didn't, so we're just going to go with the average. So they get the average of six. Uh, they do get action surge as a second level fighter. And we don't choose a sub uh, a, a, a subclass yet. And we're not multi-classing at all, so we're just going to hit next. And, of course, a fighter at second level in the player's handbook, it will let you know uh, what uh, things you get uh, every time you uh, level up. Um, like right here, uh, we get uh, action surge. Uh, and then next level, we get our martial arch 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 archetype. So there's not a whole bunch of stuff that warriors or fighters really have to do uh, when they level up. They're fairly quick to level. Uh, so we've got action surge. Got that taken care of. We're going to apply the changes. And our character is now a second level fighter. Not a problem, Nova. Take care. All right, so then, again, adventuring through. Once we get enough experience points or milestones to level, we go to level three. Um, you'll go through the player's handbook again, uh, talking about what it'll show you uh, with the fighter, what you get. Uh, we're going to stick with the fighter as well. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, look at the uh, ability that we get at third level. Obviously, this time we get to uh, select our... Uh, subclass. Um, at fourth level we get another ability score improvement or a feat. Um, then at fifth level we get extra attack uh, and it tells you like all these different things that you get uh, to help guide you through and of course after those descriptions it tells you what each one of those do. Uh, the difference in the uh, fighting styles, uh, what your second wind does, what your action surge does, etc. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and go up to third level so plus one there. Uh, we'll roll to see if we get any higher. We don't, so we go to average. Uh, we choose our subtype, and we are going to... Whoa, what happened there? Flash on my screen. I wonder if that was a power surge or something like that. Um, so then we choose our martial archetype. We're going to go ahead and choose a cavalier. From... Xanathar's Guide to Everything as the Cavalier actually has other abilities uh, in the, its uh, subclass that will help us with uh, protecting as a fighter as well. Uh, so the subclass that we get, we get some bonus proficiencies. We get Born to the Saddle and Unwavering Mark. Uh, let's go ahead and head over here. We'll open up Cavalier. And we can open up, and uh, obviously, and Xanathar's Guide to Everything has uh, in your book. You can go through and find all the features that they get. So at third level, we get bonus proficiency, born to the saddle, and unwavering mark. Uh, bonus proficiency, when we uh, choose this archetype at third level, we gain proficiency in one of the following skills of our choice. Animal handling, history, insight, performance, or persuasion. Alternatively, we could learn one language of our choice. Uh, we already have animal handling, and we already have insight. Uh, again... The charisma is only a five uh, because they had uh, that accident or whatever when they were uh, saving the villagers from the natural disaster. So performance and persuasion aren't likely choices. Uh, history wouldn't be horrible, uh, but it would be nice to learn an extra language uh, since the only languages we speak right now are common and uh, draconic. Uh, we might look to maybe speak Elvish or Dwarvish or maybe even Giant, something like that uh, that might... Uh, broaden our character's horizons or allow us to expand out with other uh, other races. Uh, then we also get starting at third level where mastery as a rider becomes apparent. We have advantage on saving throws made to fall off our mount. And if we fall off our mount and descend no more than 10 feet, we can land on our feet. Finally, mount or dismounting a creature uh, costs us only 5 feet of movement instead of half that speed. And then unwavering mark, uh, which is another ability of the Cavalier. So we're going to go next. Uh, we want to pick a language. And let's go ahead. We already have common and draconic. Um, well, let's go ahead and go with Dwarvish. We'll pick Dwarvish. We speak Dwarvish, common, and draconic. Uh, of course, our 
the way we mark lets us know everything about all these different things. And of course, shows the difference. We'll apply the changes fairly quick. All right, so we've got a level three. And then we can go up to level four. Again, taking the uh, It's got 12 there. We could not even possibly roll a 12. <laughs> uh, and then we get martial versatility and our ability score increase. All right. So whenever we reach a level of this class that grants ability improvement score feature, uh, we can do one of the following. As we shift the focus of our martial practice, we're going to place a fighting style that we know with another fighting style available to fighters. And if we know any maneuvers from Battlemaster Archetype, we're going to place one maneuver we know with another one. We're not going to change our protection uh, because the whole purpose of us playing a, uh, of building this character was to show how to create a protective uh, tank style character uh, that can uh, help defend your uh, companions, uh, your party members, your fellow party members uh, on the battlefield. All right, so we do get an ability score increase. Uh, and I think what we want to do is we can increase two ability scores by one or one ability score by two. Or we could pick a feat. Uh, if we wanted to pick a feat instead, we'll just click over here to feat and choose that there. Um, we want to go ahead and protecting, another way to protect is, you know, like a, a good defense is a good offense type of uh, reference, uh, is to get our strength up. That way we do a little bit more damage in combat and we hit uh, a little bit better. So let's go ahead and choose uh, strength uh, right here. And we're not changing the martial versatility at all. And we'll apply the changes there. Throw up to 40 hit points at fourth level. And then we'll go Cavalier level 5. That should just get us our extra attack. level up to level six and we're going to start getting here in level or two some of the abilities of the cavalier it's going to improve them as a protector oh much better so we got rolled a nine that's good for the hit points Of course, we get another ability score increase as a fighter because uh, fighters get more uh, ability score increases uh, than uh, all the other classes. Uh, Thief is uh, the rogue, I should say, is second. Um, so, not bringing up our ability score increase here. Oh, it's the next one. Okay, there we go. Let's look at some of the feats we could choose from. Um, right now, we don't have a very, we're not very fast with our initiative. We could pick alert if we wanted to. Alert's a really cool feat. Uh, we're not necessarily going to choose that. Um, but alert, well, we get a plus five bonus to our initiative, so we'd have a, a 6.12 uh, using, if you use the uh, dexterity tiebreaker, a plus six basically to our initiative. Uh, we also can't be surprised. And other creatures don't gain advantage or attack rolls against us as a result of being unseen. So if something is invisible or hidden or anything like that that we can't see, uh, then usually we get advantage on their attack rolls against us. Um, but they wouldn't because we would have the alert feat. And uh, I think we might just go ahead and select that 
uh, at 6th level. We could take our strength up to a 20. We could take our constitution up to an 18. Uh, those are both great choices. Uh, you can't really, uh, you're not really uh, making a wrong decision uh, with, with any of those choices, whether you take a feat, whether you take uh, your strength up to a 20, whether you take a con up to an 18, which gets you more hit points. Eventually, these will both get up to a 20 um, over time. As, as I mentioned, the fighter gets lots of feats. Uh, but at lower level, um, I think that us not being able to be surprised, uh, the creatures don't gain advantage on attack rolls against us, uh, and we get a plus to our initiative. Uh, again, the, the protection thing, uh, going first. If we can go in first in combat, we get to choose where we want to go on the battlefield and try to kind of set it up to where we can, you know, put ourselves into position to make ourselves a, a, a protective fighter to protect our companions. So let's go ahead and go with the uh, alert feat, um, most likely. Uh, let's see what else we have. Um, uh, of course, we could take some of these other uh, different uh, feats. Always, of course, check with your uh, dungeon master uh, to find out what uh, sources that they're allowing for feats. Are they allowing just the, the uh, specific um, books like the player's handbook, Tasha's, and Xanathar's, or are they allowing uh, other feats and different options from the different books like Mystic Odysseys of Theros, or uh, the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, or some different, uh, perhaps maybe they might even use uh, the Dragonlance books to allow uh, some of those different feats as well. Uh, there's also uh, stuff from the DM's Guild, uh, where your DM might uh, be using some stuff, some uh, third-party uh, supplements, or they might have their own feats as well, so check into those also. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and just stick with, uh, alert for now. And we're done with our sixth level. Now at seventh level, uh, cavalier, uh, we start to get some of our cavalier abilities. And we're going to get them to seventh level here. And, uh, we'll stop for the day. Um, and at least it'll give you, a, a, it's given everyone a chance. If you haven't ever created a D&D character before, it uh, gives you an option, it gives you a, a visual of uh, how to go through and uh, create your uh, character and uh, examples of how to level up your character. Uh, so again, we're going to roll. we got a seven. We're going to take the seven because that's higher than the average of six. And then we get our warding maneuver uh, at this level. Uh, we learn to fit off strikes directed at us our mounts or other creatures nearby. If, uh, we, if uh, we, us or a creature uh, that we can see within five feet of us is hit by an attack, we can roll a die eight as a reaction. If we're wielding a melee weapon or shield, we can roll the die and add the number of the rolled uh, to the target's AC against that attack. If the attack still hits, the target has resistance uh, against the attack's damage. Uh, we use this feature a number of times equal to our con modifier, the number of once, and we gain all expended use of it when we finish a long rest. So this is something where we can start using this um, a number of times equal to our con modifier, which is a plus three. Uh, so we can use this three times, and then after that, then we can roll back onto like Sentinel or Protection uh, as well. And that gives us a whole bunch of different options uh, for uh, what we can do as a protector. Uh, also, uh, if you don't want to have all of the extra choices uh, for um, the protection early on. Uh, talk with your dungeon master about, like, hey, this, uh, I picked, uh, of course, when you get ability score improvement, you can always change protective uh, protection away, since we did have, uh, we're able to pick up Sentinel, and we also have the warding uh, ability of the Cavalier. We could always go back through and change the fighting style to defense, so that way it gives us a better armor class. Uh, so that way, uh, we can use that martial versatility uh, to boost the armor class, we still have the Sentinel ability, we still have the warding uh, maneuver and all of that. Uh, so that's some ideas uh, to create, uh, especially Nova asked me if my ideas on creating the Cavalier. Uh, that gets us up to 7th level. Uh, hopefully that gives you a lot of different ideas. Uh, for those of you also that are new to creating D&D uh, characters, hopefully uh, this uh, uh, episode's been able to help you out with that. Uh, but thanks to all of our supporters, of course, especially our patrons from Patreon. Uh, if you'd like to help support the channel, please consider becoming a patron or maybe even subbing here on Twitch. Uh, we'd love uh, Amazon Prime uh, sub subscriptions. Uh, again, here on Twitch, it's uh, twitch.tv slash themasterofdungeons. Uh, the link to our Patreon page as well as all of our social media accounts can be found in the About Us section below here on Twitch. Uh, if you would, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. 
Give us some likes, retweets, all of that good stuff. Every sub, like, and share uh, helps us immensely. Uh, if you want to uh, talk more and join a, a uh, wonderful community, you can also join our Master of Dungeons community Discord server down below. Just click on the Discord panel there. Uh, joining that, uh, you can uh, help shape a caring, uh, accepting, and inclusive community. Uh, we do have a merch store available if you'd like to support us that way. We have some really cool t-shirts, uh, hoodies. Uh, some uh, caps, ball caps, and uh, some uh, different glassware on there as well. Uh, but yes, of course, we will be back tomorrow evening for Tavern Talks at the Shifty Boar. Uh, we're discussing the player test, uh, the play test six uh, from the new One D and D uh, Unearthed Arcana uh, that came out. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit uh, more tomorrow. Uh, Thursday, we do have our dungeon delving at two, from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll be off Friday because I'm going to be going uh, on a little trip with a friend of mine. Uh, we should be back uh, Sunday evening uh, for our stream. Uh, we're still determining if we have the players to run uh, one of the adventures uh, that we normally have for a live play. Uh, but uh, we will definitely let you know on the socials about that. Uh, again, thanks for watching. And as always, happy adventuring. Take care.